Okay. Welcome back, everybody. All right. Oh, bear with me for a second. Got some technical issues here. All right. I brought my little assistant here with me. She's kind of out of focus. <laughs> She's going to talk to you about chemistry today. <laughs> now, we are going to get it. All right, well, welcome back everybody. This is our third meeting and this semester of being the summer will go fast. All right, so we ended up on chapter two, a couple, couple notes. One, um, tech support recommends that when you use Canvas to utilize Chrome, I'll send an email, I think I did already, but I'll do it again to make sure you are using Chrome. And that's because uh, for whatever reason, uh, occasionally images, so you make a question with an image, for some reason, we haven't yet been able to figure out, some of you can see it, some of you do not. Um, but we have nailed it down to the fact that Chrome, at least from the people who, who created uh, Canvas, is the best browser to utilize when you're using Canvas. But we've also found exam, uh, occasions that even with Chrome, uh, the uh, image was not viewed. So if you ever get a question and you don't see the image, uh, shoot me the homework or whatever assignment in the question. I'll take a look at it. Uh, definitely for sure, we'll give you credit for that particular question, okay? All right, uh, any questions about that? Also, I keep getting uh, emails through my EDU uh, email address, and that's fine. But like I stated before, I don't uh, check that very often because I get emails from throughout the Maricopa uh, Community College system. I get emails from, from Maricopa, the central, you know, the bosses, and then I get email from Glendale and then Scottsdale, ton of email. So I don't check it as often. So if you need to contact me, again, use Canvas. Canvas, the only e email I get from Canvas is you guys. That's it. I don't get everybody else in there, so nothing will get lost. All right, so I do use the Canvas email. Um, I believe I got everything covered. Anybody have any questions? Everybody understand where everything's at, all your assignments? whatever resources you need, you got them. No questions about that. If there are, uh, shoot me an email and I'll definitely get them answered. Uh, but Canvas email, okay? Canvas email. Does that mean I want to answer the EDU or get that wrong? It just, it would take a few more days. Because like I said, I have to go through it on a daily basis. I probably get about 50, 60, 80 emails in there, all kinds of stuff in the EDU email. All right, well, let us continue then. We were on chapter two. Uh, we were talking about rounding. In fact, we did finish rounding. And I just want to rehash that just to refresh your memory. Uh, we were looking at numbers. Now, why do we want to use uh, talk about rounding? Because one, we talk about sig figs, significant figures, to determine how many sig figs you have. And so I stated all this thing, all that we're doing here is uh, um, showing you how to present your data, your mathematical answer with the correct number of digits, okay? Uh, stay away from the idea of, okay, my calculator typed in, you know, uh, I, I did uh, some mathematical function and I got, you know, 20 digits and assume that I can present those 20 digits and that will be correct. Well, that would be incorrect simply because you cannot present data. Here's the, here's the whole thing, the whole thing, what it's all about. The whole thing is this, your data should not be more accurate. Whatever data you present as an answer should not be more accurate than the least accurate number that you use to do that math mathematical function, okay? Straightforward, plain and straightforward, right? Okay, so, so if, 
if your data says I can only do two digits sig fig answer, presenting you know six digits of sig figs would be incorrect. Okay, it would not be accurate because science we try to be as accurate as possible. And even though you're presenting more digits, you might be thinking you're more accurate, but in reality you're being less accurate simply because you you did not have the accuracy to measure those values to give you all those digits. Okay. All right, so to do that, we have to make sure we round off. So at this point, what we do is we determine how many sig figs we're gonna present an answer. And we look at that digit and we're gonna do some examples of that. And then we're gonna truncate, meaning I'm gonna cut off whatever's to the right of that digit. And we're gonna do rounding and the rule straightforward. We look at the neighbor. We don't care about the digit 10 down or three down or four down, nor do you want to take a digit at the far right and say, okay, I'm gonna move this one up to six and then move that one up to eight and go that way. No, we don't care what's happening down the road. We only care about that number immediately following that number where we're going to truncate our final answer. And we look at it and look at the simple straightforward rule. If that number is less than five, that number that's gonna be truncated stays at that, at, at that value, okay? If that number is equal to or greater than five, then that number we're going to truncate goes up one value. We don't drop it, okay? We don't drop the number. We either keep the number of whatever value it is or we bump it up to the next value, okay? All right, so in that example here, we're going to round uh, <coughs> uh, 5.4 right here to one digit. One sig fig. Right now it's two sig figs. And so we immediately look to the neighbor, which is the four. And we see that uh, by this rule it is less than five. So that number that we're going to keep and we're truncating at is going to stay at five. Okay. Now, if the number is 5.5, .5, we see that the immediate neighbor is greater than or equal to five. And so that five then gets bumped up to six. Now, the other thing about rounding numbers, the thing to remember is to look at the digit that you're going to work with and determine its magnitude, its value, okay? Because you don't want to truncate the number and drop numbers and you have lost the magnitude of that number. Now, what do we mean by magnitude, okay? For example, let's take at the number 5,400 right here, okay? And they're asking us to round that digit 5,400 to one significant digit, all right? So that means that is the first digit of that number, five, okay? So then we follow, we use the rounding rules. Right here, the rounding rules. We look at the immediate, the neighbor, which is four, okay? It follows rule number one. So therefore that five remains a five. Now, any digits before where the decimal point would be, which is right here, will get converted to zero if they are not already zero. Okay, so that four gets converted to zero. Okay, now what happens occasionally, people think they're gonna, they drop those three digits, the three zeros and they end up with five. Well, what have you done to the magnitude, okay? You are in the 5,000 range right here, 5,400, you're at the 5,000 range. And by dropping these zeros, now you're down to five. And I use the example, think of it as money. Okay, I, look, I, I put a dollar bill in there just so I keep track of you know, my magnitude. I got $5,000 range here, right? So I, my answer has to come be in the $5,000 range, right, as that. If I drop these zeros, <laughs> I'm at the $5 range. Big, big difference, right? A factor of 1,000, okay, as far as the value is concerned. Now, if, if it's a number, let's say it's 5400.2. One, two, and the question is, yes, we want to do what we just did. We want to, at the, at the one sig figs, 
we want to truncate that number. So we go through the same scenario. We, you know, look at the number. Uh, it's rule number one follows. So that five right here remains at five. Now, any numbers after a decimal point completely are lost. You can drop them. You have done nothing to the magnitude of this value. Okay. You're still at, by dropping these numbers after a decimal point, you're still at the 5,000 range. Okay. So I think to remember any numbers after a decimal point, you completely drop. Any numbers before a decimal point, you convert to a zero if they're not already a zero. Okay. Now, some people will say, oh, wait a minute. What if I do this? What if I, instead of dropping a 212, I convert those to zero? Can anybody tell me what I've done to this number by converting the 212 to zeros? What have I done to the number of significant figures? Total for 5,000.000. How many sig figs does that number have? Okay, let me see. Somebody got an answer. Four? Four? Oh, no, a little bit more. Seven is correct, Gerardo. Seven is correct. Remember, these zeros, if you ask the question, is there an integer anywhere in front of these zeros? And that's yes. Okay. Is there a decimal point anywhere in that number? And the answer is yes. So that means that all these zeros count as being significant. That means there's seven sig figs in this number. The question was, put it in one sig fig. And so by not dropping those numbers after the decimal point and putting zeros back in, you have increased the accuracy of that value, though you don't have the accuracy to begin with, okay? So long-term memory, numbers, or zeros, any, any number after the decimal point, drop it. Numbers before the decimal point, convert to zero if they're already, if they're not already zero, okay? Don't, don't lose the magnitude, the magnitude of the number you're working with. All right, so let's, let's do some examples. Question states, and an important part here in these questions is to make sure you read the question correctly and, and, and make sure you understand what the question is asking, okay? It's saying here, round these numbers off to three sig figs, okay? So your answer should have three sig figs. Right now, the number 1.8374 has how many sig figs? How many six figs does 1.8374 have? Okay, we got five. That is correct. We got five six figs. The question here is telling us to convert it, convert this number to one, three six figs. Now, why would you do this? Okay, well, this number you obtained could, is the result of some calculation that you did, okay? Specifically a multiplication or a division. We're gonna talk about adding and subtracting. It's a little slightly different, but the same, the same premise is that in either mathematical function, multiply, divide, add, subtract, the idea is we cannot be more accurate than the digits that we started out with. Okay, so you did the math, you end up at 1.8374, but because of the numbers you used to get to that number, the one with the least number of sig figs had three. So your answer should have no more than three sig figs. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. So starting from the first whole number on the left and counting to the right, count to the three position, three sig fig position, one, and that would be the three. Okay, so that means that anything after the three is going to be dropped. Okay, now the question is, what do we do with the three? Okay, do we keep it at three or we round it up? Well, we immediately look to the neighbor. So that's why I draw that little arrow there. Look to the neighbor. It's a seven. 
based on the rules is greater than or equal to five. Therefore, that three becomes 1.84. Don't forget the units because that number by itself is meaningless without a unit. 1.84 centimeters. Okay. So we had a question. Uh, Yes, okay. Sometimes the question, Natasha had a question, does the same thing apply when being asked to run to two decimal places? And that is correct. They may say this, the, the, the question may be, and you'll see this in, the, in the, the lab, instead of saying the correct sig figs, they may tell you to round it to three decimal places, four decimal places, whatever number of decimal places. So what you do, you go to that decimal place, if it's two decimal places, let's, Let's say, let's say the number is, uh, yeah, same thing here. Here they may say round it to three sig figs or round it to two decimal places. Well, in both cases, that is the three, posi the three number position, okay? Yeah, and that, okay, does that make sense, Natasha? Yeah, so that goes, it's important that you read the question, okay? Read the question carefully. Um, now, What's happened, and we're trying. I'm trying to get that corrected. Now you'll see that here in a minute. Well, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait to bring that up till we get to the adding and subtracting part. We're gonna we're gonna distinguish between multiplying and dividing versus adding and subtracting. Okay. All right. And so here we got three sig figs. So our answer would be 1.84 centimeters, which has three sig figs, or the question may have been rounded to two. Uh, two decimal places, okay? All right, let me clear this up. All right, 1.84. All right, in this same scenario, we want to round it off to three, uh, three significant figures, okay? Okay, so at the three significant figure, we're gonna determine starting from all the way from left, the seven coming across, the six is where we have the three sig figs, okay? Now, keep track of the magnitude here. You are at the 7,000 range, okay? 7,000 range. So your answer should end up in the 7,000, uh, um, 7, the, the 7,000 range, excuse me, okay? Second of all, we have a num we have decimal points. So you can see hopefully that what's gonna happen is that three and the two, we're gonna get rid of. It's after the decimal point. However, any numbers before the decimal point, we're gonna uh, convert to a zero. So that two would be converted to a zero, okay? All right. And so our number becomes seven, 1160 that is rounded off to three sig fig. Okay. Or the question could have been rounded out to, uh, well, I don't want to confuse it. We'll leave it at that three sig figs. Okay. Notice it, the answer was not 716. Okay. And that would be the answer if you were to drop that two. But don't want to do that because you are in the seven thousand dollar range, not in the seven hundred dollar range. All right, here's another one. It looks a little more confusing. You might think here, but for a second, remember those zeros are leading zeros and therefore are not significant. So we don't count them in the significant uh, digit position. So the first significant digit is at one. Okay. And we count, uh, go from left to right, no different than we did for, for number one and number two. And we locate the third significant figure position, which is that one. We look at the neighbor and round it up. Notice here that the one, the five, and the four that follow that one are going to be dropped. Okay. And here's your answer. Now, the thing to remember, you might say, well, why can I, instead of dropping the one, five, and four, why can I just convert the one, five, and four 
two zeros, okay? Okay, what would be wrong with reporting your answer as I wrote there? Or is there anything wrong with it? <laughs> what is wrong between reporting my answer like that or like I wrote down here? What do we got here? Okay, the last zero added more sig figs, exactly. By adding those three zeros and not dropping the 154 and converting those to zeros, okay, I've added this zero, that zero, that zero. Okay, the question is, are they significant? Well, let's figure it out. For these zeros, is there an integer in front of those zeros? The answer is yes. Is there a decimal point anywhere in that number? The answer is yes. Those, those three last zeros therefore count. So therefore, how many sig figs do I have in this last number I wrote? Okay, how many sig figs do I have in this number? Six, exactly. Six. What did the question ask? Three. Okay. And so by adding more zeros for numbers you dropped increases the accuracy, which you can't do because you didn't have that accuracy to begin with. Okay. Remember, this number that you started off with is the result of some mathematical function that had an X amount of sig figs. In this example, Three sig figs is our least accurate uh, number that we utilize to get to these numbers. Okay, so our answer cannot have more than three sig figs. Plus, remember these numbers one, five, and four are after the decimal point, so we can drop them. Remember what we said: any numbers after the decimal point can be dropped if needed, and that's what you do. You don't want to put zero back in there. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, it's clear. <coughs> 24, 9, 2, 5. Go through the three safe pick position, which would be the nine. Okay. Uh, we're looking at uh, the neighbor, which is two. That means that the nine remains a nine. The two and the five are before the decimal point, therefore, are converted to zero. Because why? Look at the magnitude again. We are at the 24,000 range, <clears throat> okay? We are not at the 200. If you drop the two and a five, you end up at 249, which is not the correct magnitude, okay? You're at the 24,000 range. All right, key points about these examples is, is drop the numbers after the decimal point, if they're going to be dropped, don't convert into zero, okay? But numbers before a decimal point or where a decimal point would be, like this, this example, that decimal point would be right after that five, the last example, okay? But, uh, so we replace those numbers with a zero. If we don't do that, we change the magnitude, the value of the of that number you're working with, which you don't want to do. All right, now, <clears throat> here's the thing. Keep this in long-term memory. Adding, subtracting, we think significant digits, okay? When you, when you let me try this again. Multiply and divide, sorry, I got, got twisted here. Multiply and divide, we think Sig figs, okay? So multiply and divide, think significant figures, okay? Your answer should have no more significant digits than the least accurate number, the number with the least number of sig figs, okay? Adding and subtracting, think decimal places, okay? 
decimal places. Don't think sig figs. And we're gonna, I'm gonna give you an example. We don't mix and match the two, okay? Again, in both scenarios, your final answer cannot be more accurate than the least accurate digit. We're gonna do some examples here, okay? To, to demonstrate that, okay? Multiply, divide, think sig figs, add, subtract, think decimal places. Least number of decimal places. All right, for example, Let's take this number, 13.5478. And we're going to subtract 11.20. Oh, we could have added, it makes no difference, OK? But I mean, let's look at the digits, for example. Notice that 13.5478 has four decimal places, OK? Which is very accurate. It probably it probably used that that electronic balance or uh, some type of high caliber uh, instrument to measure that number of decimal places. Okay, it just happens to be feet. Maybe maybe there's a laser beam. Okay, the second number is only accurate to two decimal places. Had nothing to do with sig figs. Okay, nothing to do with sig figs. All right, so you do the math like you normally would do, and in this case, subtract, or in this famous addition, because the same rules apply, and you end up with that number, 2.3478. Now, because the least accurate number was this one, because it had two decimal places, means that your answer can only have two decimal places, because that is the least accurate. The, the top number is accurate to what, uh, four ten thousandths, as the second one is accurate only to the hundredth degree, as far as this one. And so we're going to take the bottom number at 2.3478, and we're going to truncate it at the two decimal place position, okay? And so we do the same rules we did before, identify that number, which is four, look at the neighbor, which is seven, it's greater than or equal to five, therefore that four gets up to five. So our answer is 2.35 with only two decimal places, okay? Because that is the least accurate measurement we have. Note this, note here, nothing to do with significant digits. Okay, let me, let me, let me clear this up a little bit here. And then I want to this clear this up. How many sig figs does this first number have? 13.5478. Okay, six, that is correct. One, two, three. We got six sig figs. What about the 11.20? How many sig figs there? We got four sig figs, that is correct. Okay, look at our answer. How many sig figs did our answer have? Three. Okay, so in this scenario, when adding and subtracting, significant figures do not play a factor, okay? In fact, if you ever come upon, upon a question and it's asking you to add and subtract, the question may say, present your data of the correct significant figures. We're trying to, I'm trying to find those questions and correct them and say, correct, present your data with the correct number of decimal places because you're adding or subtracting this, okay? But whenever you see present your data with the correct sig figs, first look at the mathematical function of what you're doing. If you're multiplying or dividing to get to that number, yes, then think sig figs. But if you are adding or subtracting to get to whatever number you need to get, then think decimal places. So when they say sig figs and you're adding and subtracting, they're telling you to put it in the correct number of decimal places, all right? So don't mix and match the two when it comes to sig figs versus decimal places, and it depends on the mathematical function. In both scenarios, okay, you are presenting your data with, uh, based on the least accurate number that you have in your data, okay? Okay, let's, okay. any questions about this? Okay, so focus on 
uh, decimal places when you're adding and subtracting. Now the question may be, even though you, after you do mathematics, they may ask you how many sig figs you have in your answer, like what I just did with 2.35. Yeah, you know, the same thing applies. You determine the sig figs by, you know, the rules that we had to determine whether something is significant or not. So yes, there's three sig figs in 2.35. Okay. All right, this is just a reminder to tell you, show you where you are with respect to decimal places, you know, 10 place, 100 place, et cetera. Yeah. All right, multiplication and division. As we stated when I first started adding and subtracting, here we focus on the number of sig figs, okay? For example, we're going to multiply here. Okay, so how many how many sig figs does three this number have? Three point five four six half. What do we got here? Four. That's correct. We got four sig figs here. What about one point four? And here we got two sig figs. Okay. Notice that we are multiplying. Okay. Therefore, if the same rule would, would, would pertain, we were dividing. In this case, we are multiplying, but it could be the true for division. We look at the least number of sig figs. That means that our answer should have no more than two sig figs. Okay? Because this number here, 1.4, is the least accurate number. And therefore, our answer should be truncated at the two sig fig position. Now, you don't want to truncate. You don't want to round anything off don't round nothing off the three point you get take the numbers that you have are given do the mathematics in your calculator okay and then and then after the full number set find that two sig fig position and truncate from that position okay so if we do the multiplication we end up at 4.9644 we want to be at the two sig fig position, okay, for our answer. So that means that that's the nine, okay? We look at the neighbor, which is a six, which is based on the rules. That means that the nine gets bumped up to 10. So we're going to have to carry the one to five. So our answer is 5.0. And note, note the, don't forget the units, okay? Here's where we get a little bit of algebra going on. We got meters times meters gives you meters square. Okay. And if we were going to, and that's basically area. And if we we're going to multiply this by another meters, let's say, you know, two meters, and we end up unit wise, okay, unit wise would be meters cube. And if we multiply that by meters again, meters to the fourth power, meters to the fifth. Okay. Don't forget your unit. Units here, so um, all right. So all right. So our answer should would be five point zero, which has two sig figs. You may say, "Well, wait a minute. That zero doesn't look like significant." Ask the questions for that zero. Okay. Ask the question for the zero. Is there an integer in front of that zero? Yes. Is there a decimal point in that number? Yes. Therefore, that zero counts as being significant. And uh, we have two sig figs in our answer. Again, no more, no more accurate than the least accurate number here, which is the 1.4. Okay. So maybe, maybe this number could have been measured with a laser beam, and maybe this number with the with the ruler. Okay, and so you can see the ruler is going to be least accurate, and so therefore your answer should not be more accurate than the least accurate number. You may be tempted to think that if I present that number that I'm putting accuracy into your number. You're not. You're not because that measurement, the 1.4, is the least accurate number you measured. You know, like I said, it could have been measured with the ruler as compared to the other number being measured with, say, a laser beam. Okay. All right.
Okay. Any questions about presenting your data with the correct number of significant uh, digits slash the correct number of decimal places? Okay, depending on what you're doing mathematically. And I, again, if the question says present your answer with the correct, correct number of significant digits, look at the mathematical function. If you're adding and subtracting, and convert that comment to correct number of decimal places. If you're multiplying and dividing, then yes, think sig fix. Okay. All right, which brings us to scientific notation. Well, what this is, is a method of presenting very large, large numbers, of putting these numbers in the calculator, okay? If uh, you were to type that number into that calculator, depending on the calculator you have, it may not take it. If you to type that number there, one, five, six, seven, nine, three, so on and so forth. And so by converting it into scientific notation, you're able to input that big giant number. The same token, it, it could be an extremely tiny, tiny, tiny number, like the one below, where you got 0. 0.00000, 000, you know, so forth. It's a very small number. So the same scenario, a similar process of putting that into your calculator so you can do calculations. We will be working with large numbers, okay? Uh, specifically, one number which is called Avogadro's number. We'll, we'll get to know Avogadro pretty well here. But his number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So take 6.02 and move that decimal point over to the right 23 times. That's how big that number is, okay? All right, well, let's, let's do this. Let's, do, let's run through some examples. We're going to do this manually first. Then we're going to show how to do it on your calculator. Now, uh, depends on the type of calculator that you have. And I got examples uh, of, unless there's a new, a fourth type, I got examples of the three types of calculators that present or, or you are able to input scientific notation. All right, let's take this large numbers specific. Um, the distance of the earth to the sun is roughly say 93 million miles, okay? Now, what we do is first, this number obviously is much, much greater than one, okay? This 93 million. And so we know where the decimal point will be, right? Everybody understood, understands that we need we know where the decimal point will be. So from that position, where the decimal point is for a number greater than one, which this is, we go from right to left and we count the decimal places and we move it from right to left until we find the last integer and we stop right before the last integer. So if you go here, uh, count the decimal places. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Here's the last integer, nine. We stopped right before it. So I make note that's seven decimal places, right? So we move the decimal point over 9.3. Now, before I forgot, I forgot step number one. Step number one, when you have a number, note the number of sig figs that you have because you want to present your answer, again, with the correct number of sig figs in the scientific notation. Here we have, anybody can know the, the number here, 93 million, how many significant digits we have in this number? 93 million, how many do we have? We have two, that is correct, okay? So therefore, make note, I got two sig figs, so I want to put it in two sig fig format in scientific notation. I determine how many decimal places I need to go from right to left. So I write down 9.3. I got two sig figs times 10 to the seventh power. The seventh power is how many decimal places I move to get to the last integer. Okay. Another way to write this is what they're saying is this. 
is nine times 10, 93, 9.3 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. We got here one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, that's what they're doing. They're saying nine, 9 9.3 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, you know, seven times gives me 93 million. And so when I multiply, it's understood it's 10 to the one power, each one 10 to, the, I just add the coefficients. So I got seven coefficients, exponents, I should make. So 9.3 times 10 to the seven power is the number 93 million written in scientific notation. Now, here's the format. The format, the correct format for scientific notation is there's always a integer, and there may or may not be after the integer a decimal point. Okay. In this case, there is, followed by whatever number of digits you need, significant digits. Okay. So it, it would be incorrect. It would be incorrect format. Yes, this number here, 93 times 10 to the sixth power, is 90, another way to write 92 million, but it is not the correct format to write that number inside the notation. So always is an integer, maybe a decimal point, and then followed by whatever numbers you have. Now the advantage, the advantage of using scientific notation is this. Those numbers in front of the times always show the correct number of say figs. So if you are given an ambiguous, oh, got a question here. Uh, okay, good point. And the answer, Eduardo, the answer would be no. The question, if you look at your chat, it says, can we write 9.3 e, 9 e to the seventh power? And that would be incorrect because that's not the, the format of the number, the simple x for times and then 10 to the whatever. Power. The e represents the notation the calculator has, okay? So we're going to go through some examples now. We're going to have to, you need to convert that, that number, and we'll do this. The number is 9.3 e to the seventh. And that is what your calculator gave, gives you to convert that to the correct sentiment notation. So 9.3 times 10 to the seventh. Okay. All right. Good question. Uh, and again, going back to the format, make sure you are integer, followed by decimal point if it's needed, and then whatever numbers, but not like shown here at 93 times 10 to the six. That would be the incorrect format. Where is the 10 coming in? Natasha, I don't, I don't follow the question. The 10, the question is, where is the 10 coming from? You know, in this example we just did that Eduardo had? Yes, because your calculator, some calculators can put your answer in the correct scientific notation and present 9.3 times 10 to the seventh, like so, okay? However, the majority of calculators present your answer, and we'll do some examples with the E to designate that this is scientific notation. And so that E represents times t, the X, the times and the 10, that seven represents the exponent, okay? So you take that 9.3 E seven from your calculator and convert it to the scientific notation, take the times 10 and replace that E. Did you get that Natasha? Okay, and we'll do some examples there. All right, good questions. Uh -oh. All right. Um, let me turn this up a little bit. 
Okay. Now, with respect, now notice here, notice here when we had a large number greater than one, the exponent, in this case, times 10 to the seventh, was a positive number. Okay. So by looking at it, you know, 9.3 times 10 to the seventh, positive seven, it is a number greater than one. When we have numbers that are very small, that exponent becomes a negative. So how do we determine, how do we do that? Well, no different than we did with the number, the number larger than one. Determine where the decimal point's at. Obviously a number less than one, we know the decimal, the decimal point is right there. And in this case, instead of going from right to left, we're going from left to right. And we do that and we continue counting the number of decimal places until we find the first integer and then we stop immediately right after the first integer, okay? Uh, and point number two, the one I should say, is first determined number of sig figs. So looking at this number, 0 0.000017, how many sig figs do we have to work with here? Okay, and that's correct. We got two sig figs, so I'll make note of that, okay? I got two sig figs, and that's my answer. Should have two sig figs at the end. And it's a number much less than one. That means I'm going to have a negative exponent. So starting from the decimal point, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, so ten, and I make a negative for my information because it is a number less than one. All right. And I stop at right after the first integer, which is the one. So I, I write 1.7, okay, times 10 to the negative 10, okay? Now, your calculator may give it as 1.7 E negative 10, okay? That is your calculator. That's not the correct format. You take that E, and you replace, another way of saying is E will be equal to 10 times, uh, times that factor, times, replace it with time symbol in the 10, okay? So this becomes this and this to convert it to scientific notation. And then that number after the E from the calculator is the exponent, in this case, a negative, okay? So we got a negative. And another way, another way to look at this is what they're doing is they're taking 1.7 and they're taking dividing that by this. We've got one, two, three, four, five, um, et cetera. I'm gonna get 10 of them. There's 1.7 divided by 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And <clears throat> because 10 to the negative one is equal to one over 10. All right. So the negative exponent tells you it's a very small, small number, very small number. And again, the same format, you end up with an integer, maybe a decimal point, maybe not, and then whatever follows after, after the decimal point, okay? All right. For example, let's let's take some examples and we will convert them to scientific notation. You have the number there. First thing to do is one, step one, and you're gonna find me that every time when especially in the beginning, I always go stepwise process. Okay, it may be and, and it may be repetitive, but that's okay. If it's repetitive, it's probably for a reason. Eventually, you get to the point where you can bypass this step. But in the beginning, when this is your first time in doing something, it's good to have a step process to get to the answer, okay? I, I, it's analogous to me as the first time you rode a bike. I, very few people I'm aware of, I'm sure there's some out there, and immediately jumped on a two-seater uh, without training wheels and took right off and didn't wipe out, okay? It took a little time to kind of work through it before you're able to go down the highway with no, not holding down to the steering wheel. 
So I equate that here with these type of problems. We go stepwise, boom, boom, boom. Okay, step number one, determine how many sig figs your number has. You gotta maintain those sig figs, okay? Number one, can anybody tell me 548.005? How many sig figs do we have there? And we got six, that is correct, okay? How about uh, the next number, number two? We, we got three, that is correct. 68 million, 68 million, 100,000, that is three. Number three has three sig figs, that's correct. Uh, the, the four zeros in the beginning are leading zeros. And then the last one, one sig fig, okay? So that means that we're gonna keep track of that so that our answer has the correct number of sig figs at the end. Step number two, find out where the decimal point is, okay? Take a number one, here's the decimal point. Obviously this number is a number greater than one. So that tells me that my exponent will be a positive value. So I'm gonna have 10 to some number up here, okay? So going to the decimal point, in this case, is it's a number greater than one, I'm moving from right to left until I find the last, the last integer. So starting there, I go one and two, okay? That means that my exponent is a positive two because I am, I have a positive, positive a, uh, number much greater than one. So it would be a positive value, the exponent. So that becomes 5.48005. Did I lose my sig figs here at all? No, I did not, okay? My sig figs are maintained, okay? 5.48005 still has six, six sig figs, and then times 10 to the second power, okay? So I was able to convert that number to scientific notation. All right, let's do the second one. Same, similar scenario, find the decimal point. Obviously I'm gonna have, I notice the 68 million, obviously this number is much greater than one. I'm gonna have a positive exponent. And so I go from here, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, okay? So my exponent is seven. Now you can see here, I got a little trainer. I got three, I, do I have to count each position? No, eventually you, you get the gist of it here, right? I got three here, six and seven. I go three, six, seven, okay? I'll, eventually, you know, you get, you, you get to learn your own little shortcuts. But for right now, until you're familiar with it, count every decimal point. All right, I got, then I write down 6.81. 6.81 times 10 to the seventh power. I don't have to write the positive. It's understood to be positive. Okay. All right. Uh, number three, that number obviously is a number that is less than one. And so, and I have three sig figs. So my answer is gonna have three sig figs. So my exponent is times 10 to the negative some value. Okay, I know it's negative because this number is less than one. So find a decimal point, count the de decimal places, one, two, three, and four until I'm to the right immediately following the first integer. Okay, so it's 4.00, 4.00 times 10 to the negative four. Okay, and then finally the last one, Obviously, it's a number greater than one, it's 2,000, so I might have a positive in, uh, exponent. So I go one, two, and three. So three, and it's simply a two, okay? Because remember, those, my final answer is uh, only has one sig fig. 2,000 only has one sig fig. So when I convert that to scientific notation, it is two times 10 to the third, okay? Now, let me 
clear this up and I'll bring in the, the better handwriting. <laughs> okay. Now, one advantage about scientific notation, and it does occur sometimes in the problems, is that your answer, the final answer that you get, for example, um, let's say, let's use this, okay? Maybe the answer after you do your calculation, you come up with the number 2000, but one of the numbers you utilized in this multiplication or division had two sig figs, okay? But your answer after you're done was 2000. Obviously you can't write 2000 with two sig figs, right? Because you only got one integer and the zeros don't count. And I can't write it by putting a decimal point after like this, what have I done? If I go 0 0.0 for the number 2000, how many sig figs do I have now? for 2000.0. You can tell me that. Yeah, I have five, exactly. And so I can't put a decimal point arbitrarily to give me the digits that I want. But what I do is I convert it to scientific notation. Why? Because scientific notation always shows the correct number of sig figs. So I can take 2000 and I go 2.0 times 10 to the third. Now that writes 2000 with the correct number of sig figs, which is two, but I've not done nothing. I've done nothing to change the magnitude, to change its value, okay? I just put the decimal point at zero. I increase the number of sig figs. If the, if the problem was uh, right, write 2000 with uh, five sig figs, okay? Let's say they said, you're gonna write that answer with five sig figs. Well, no, no problem. No problem, what do I do? I simply write two point and then four, one, two, three, and four. I got five sig figs. 2.0000 times 10 to the third is the number 2000 written with five sig figs. And it's extreme if you wanted 10 sig figs and more zeros, okay? The point being is when you have a, a problem, a mathematical problem, and it's ambiguous as far as you're not quite sure about how to write the answer with the correct number of sig figs, convert it to scientific notation, okay? There's no question there that you will write it in the correct, with the correct number of sig figs. All right, so this brings us to the calculators. <coughs> okay, now um, there's two type, three types of buttons written here. Now, on the bottom right in white is the Windows calculator. The Windows calculator they have it was EXP button. Okay, I got it written right here. Let me. Um, right here, an EXP button. That, that is one button, that is uh, for Windows calculator, the button to put things into scientific notation. Now there's also, some calculators have a double E button. If you notice here with the arrow, it's a little bit, the, the letters are kind of worn out, but it's two E's, two capital E's. That, and for that calculator, that is the uh, button for, uh, to put your number into scientific notation. And then the newest calculators have a button with um, right here. It has X or times and then 10 to whatever power X. Now, don't confuse that. There's another button here on calculators is 10 to the X power, okay? Don't use that one, all right? Sometimes also you might uh, be tempted to type in a number and then hit the multiplication and hit this button and then to the X power. That is not the correct button, okay? You, you go ahead and take a simple number and do it what you think it might be and then use the correct button. You're gonna have two completely different values, okay? So there's three type of buttons, EXP button, 
uh, capital double E or the one that's listed as uh, X times 10 to the X, okay? Now, another button you should look for is the toggle button to put you into the negative because you're gonna need it sometimes for um, using, you know, obviously using negative values. Now, for the Windows calculator, see the little button down here? It has a plus slash negative. That's a simple toggle button that you, you type in a number, you hit it, it'll convert it positive, negative, positive, negative, okay? Uh, look around on this other calculator, you got, this is the toggle button for negative. And then uh, the other one for the other calculator, here's a button right there. Check your manual, okay? Check your manual for your calculator to find out which one, which button there is. Find the negative, the toggle for negative positive number. Find the button to do um, uh, uh, scientific notation. Okay. All right. Now let's 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 do some examples. Uh, let me clear this up. And what I'm going to use is the calculator, the scientific notation. We're going to take this number here. Okay. And we're going to. Uh, Type it into our calculator, which is 2.39 times 10 to the ninth, this number up, up on top. Okay. Now, let me share my calculator. And I'm using the Windows calculator. Hopefully, you all can see it. Notice here's my EXP button, and here is my plus and minus. Check your calculator, see what yours, how yours work. But we're going to take that number. 2.39, okay, and then put it 2.39 times 10 to the uh, ninth power. Let me see if I can write that number we're going to do 2.39 times 10 to the ninth power. That's the number we're going to use. All right, so I would type in 2.39. Whoa. Got too many of them. 2.39. Now, if for some reason that number was negative, I just hit the toggle button here, and guess what? I'm now I got a negative 2.39. Okay, but it's a positive number. We'll leave it a positive. Now, when I hit the EXP button or the double E button or the X times 10 to the X power button, okay, that puts me into the scientific format for the calculator. Note here, the calculator cannot display, the Windows calculator cannot display times 10 to the X power. So what it does, it displays it as E and then plus zero. Right now it could be it's zero, but I wanna do, once I hit the EXP button, now I can input the exponent. So now I have inputted 2.39 times 10 to the ninth power. If that exponent was a negative, guess what? I just hit the negative button there. And I can toggle back and forth if that was a negative exponent, okay? Now, the numbers input into the calculator. Now I can do whatever mathematical function I want to do. I can multiply, divide, subtract, whatever you want to do, but that big number is in there now, okay? Into the calculator. If I were to multiply this number by, I don't know, one times 10 to the 10 power, that's my answer, right? You, I forgot, there's a third button. Sometimes your calculator will output that number in long form, okay? You may, let me, let me clean it up. I'll put that number in long form. What I did is I multiplied, you know, that number input by some other crazy long, big number, and that's what I got, okay? And using a calculator, look for either the Windows calculator has a button called F hyphen E, okay? And that converts it from engineer into long-term back into scientific notation. If I toggle that, guess what? That kicks me back into the scientific notation for the calculator. Now, I don't 
give the answer is 2.39e plus 19. I need to convert that to correct scientific indexation format. So it would be 2.39 times 10 to the ninth. Okay. Convert that to that. And that is what you input. Okay. Oh, 19. It's a big number. Okay. All right. So practice with um, your calculator. If you have any questions, uh, check your manual. And if it doesn't help you, yeah, feel free to send an email. If you got an image of your calculator, take a snapshot of your calculator, I'll, I'll be more happy to look at it. Uh, one, th one additional thing with the calculators, all the functions that I got up here are the primary functions. So they're the main button. Sometimes some calculators have the scientific notation as a secondary button. So you would have to, uh, you know, so, you know, it might be, you know, the, like in the case up here in, in the right, that the function may be here written in yellow, for example. It's a secondary function. So you got to hit the second button to access that function. So check your calculator, make sure. So you can determine the, the proper way to, to uh, input scientific notation. Okay, this is a, a uh, close-up shot of the calculators that I'm aware of. Uh, some of these are pretty old. It's got Texas very but you don't need it. You don't need a fancy calculator as long as you have you know, a $10, $15 calculator that supports scientific notation is more than enough, okay? Now, the, the, um, the assignment, when you use the lockdown browser, I have made it so there you have access to the calculator that the lockdown browser uh, uh, offers. Some people don't, don't like it, but it's there for you if you don't have a calculator. A freestanding calculator, do your calculations. All right. Any questions about this? Any questions? Okay. Well, let, let's do let's do an example here. We're going to take two point eight four times ten to the twenty third, and we're going to divide it by seven point two eight times ten to the twelfth. Okay. And so let me. Um, share my calculator again. Oh. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to take, uh, I'm just going to write it here. 2.84 times 10 to the 23rd, 23rd. We're going to divide that by 7.24 times 10 to the 12th. Okay. All right. Let's go. So let's clear the calculator. We're going to input the numerator, which is 2.84. Exponent double e or x times 10 to the x power, and then the that is 23. Okay, that is the numerator in scientific, scientific notation for the Windows calculator. Then we're going to do the math, we're going to divide by uh, 7.24 exponent 12. Okay, and we hit equal. Now, question number one. How many sig figs should our answer have? Three, exactly, because 2.84 has three, 7.24 has three. So therefore our answer should have no more than uh, three sig figs. Clear this up a little bit here. 
notice that our answer in the calculator, you know, it's long, long form there. Okay, but there's our answer in scientific notation. We should not have more than three sig figs. And so therefore we go through the three sig fig position, starting from the far left, one, two, and three. So we're gonna truncate right here at the first two. We look at the neighbor. Neighbor is two, which is less than five. Therefore that two remains a two. And so our answer in the correct scientific notation will be 3.92 times 10 to the 10th power. Okay. All right. Let us close that. Go back to the problem. There we go, okay? All right, if your number doesn't come up that way, maybe you're not using the button correctly. Keep trying it, okay? Um, if you're still having challenges, then, you know, let me know. We'll figure out, you know, we, we can make it happen. Check the manual. First, first logical place to start is your manual for your calculator, okay? All right. Um, we did talk about the second function. Some, some calculators, the, that scientific notation is not the primary function, okay? Some calculators present their data as follows, which is not, not the correct scientific notation. So, you know, uh, you already saw some examples. Maybe this number could be in this format or your calculator can put that same number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and say E8, okay? Both of these are not in the correct scientific notation. So you make, read about your calculator and be able to then take your answer and convert all these and let's say three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you used all of them, nine times 10 to the A power. This would be the correct format, okay? All right. Um, I talked about the mode where you go back and forth with long, the numbers in long form or in scientific, scientific notation. <coughs> um, you know, be, get familiar with your calculator, okay? All right, which brings us to the final part here, which is pretty straightforward and we'll be done with this chapter and we'll jump into the next chapter here after we take a short break. But this year, I think you're well familiar with your, your assignments, you know, you, you have uh, an X number of points overall for all of your assignments, but then each assignment has a certain percentage, certain percentage to your overall grade. Right? And so simply put, it is, a, it is a ratio, a mathematical function, by the way, of the part divided by the whole, okay, times 100 that puts it into the percentage. And this is true for your grade, and this is true for literally any that want to calculate its percentage. For example, there's a gold ring that has a mass, total mass of 239.8 or five grams. An analysis was done of that material and it turns out that of that 239.45 grams, it consists of 198.3 grams of pure gold, okay? Question is what is the percent of this ring, percent gold of this ring, okay? And so we simply set it up. We got the part, which is the 198.38, divided by the whole, which is the mass of the whole ring, okay, times 100. Now, obviously, your calculator will give you all these numbers, 82.84, so on and so forth. But again, you present your data with the least accurate 
number that you utilize. In this case, the mathematical function is division. So we think sig figs. So we see that the numerator has five sig figs and the denominator has five sig figs. So our answer should have no more than five sig figs. So we go to the five sig fig position for my answer, which would be one, two, three, four, and five, which would be this eight right there. Okay. Look at the neighbor, which is a one, okay, which is less than five. Therefore, that eight remains at eight. We drop everything, truncate everything. And so our answer is for this particular problem, this consists, this goal consists of 82.848% goal. Okay. All right. Pretty straightforward. Nothing, nothing too complicated with respect to mathematics, it's just the ratio. All right. Which brings us to the end of chapter two. All right, any questions? Almost 24K, yeah. That would be a very expensive ring. All right, well, I tell you what, let's, let's uh, take a little break. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm back. Um, any questions before I proceed to continue anything else? Let me get this myself organized here. Okay. All right. We're gonna this particular chapter deals with metric units, units and English units of conversion of converting from one unit, one set of units to the other. <laughs> It, it's going to give us practice in learning a technique where we're going to use the same technique to convert from when we've got a chemical equation so we can do actual calculations to determine, you know, how much product we're going to make if reactant A and B come together. Okay. Now, so what I'm going to do is what I want to get into the metric side of it because as um, as an American born educated student, I had a challenge with the metric system. Now, those of you who you know come from other countries, obviously you use a metric system uh, straightforward. Okay, you may have a challenge with the English units, but we'll we'll go over over some of that stuff. So what I want to do is take a little time first and talk about the metric system and how it is utilized. How we're going to utilize it. Now we have you have access to this particular file, okay. And what I've done here, we have the mass, volume, and length units. We talked about mass here. We use uh, grams, lowercase g. Volume we use liters, okay, uh, capital L, and length we use meters. Now <clears throat> the kilo. The K generally means a, a factor of a thousand greater. So if you look at the first entry there, you'll see that one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams, or one kilogram, one kiloliter is equal to a thousand liters. The same prefix, a thousand, or one thousand meters, and one kilometer, I should say, is equal to a thousand meters. All right. Now, once we pass that, we get down to the, this, the, the, the reference unit, the, the gram, for example, we got one gram. What we have here is one gram is equal to 10 decigrams. Now, you might think decigrams, it might be a bit, bit of a challenge, but think of it this way. One decade with respect to years. In one decade is 10 years, right? And so in, there are 10 decigrams deci, D-E-C-I, grams in one gram. And the same token for with respect to liters, there are 10 deciliters in one liter. And there are 10 decimeters in one meter. Okay. Uh, centigrams. How many years in a century? Well, 100. All right. So in one gram, there are 100 centigrams. 
In one liter, there are 100 centiliters. And in one meter, there are 100 centimeters. All right. Now, with respect to millennium, maybe you're familiar with the term how many years in a millennium. There are a thousand years in a millennium. Therefore, in one gram, there are a thousand milligrams. Okay. In one liter, there are a thousand milliliters. And in one meter, there are a thousand millimeters. Now, the one you may not be familiar with is the term micro. It looks like a U with a little lip up front. This is micro. Okay. There are one million micrograms in one gram. And there are one million microliters in one liter and one million micrometers in one meter. Okay. Now you think about it, let's, let's take the example of a meter stick. You know, we all know what a meter stick is approximately like about this, this much. Well, within that distance, there are 10 decimeters within that unit. Also within that one meter distance, there are 100 centimeters. And there's also 1,000 millimeters. There's 1,000 little units. And there are also a million micrometers, all within that given unit with respect to length, okay? Now, every factor here, every factor here is nothing more than a ratio. And this is true for any ratio that we're gonna work with, be it dollars per hour. That is a ratio that we can, we can use, okay, to do calculations. Miles per hour, density, remember we talked about density. The volume, um, excuse me, mass over volume, grams per milliliter. It's a ratio. Being a ratio, we can write it, write it in one or two ways. For example, we know that there are a thousand grams in one kilogram. Okay. Okay. So we can write that either with kilograms in the numerator or with kilograms in the denominator. Now, these numbers, these numbers, leave them as they are. Now, you may be tempted to invert it, okay? Take the one 1,000, so it would be like 0 0.001 kilograms per gram. My suggestion is don't do that. Just leave the numbers as they are and just flip them over as needed, okay? Just invert it as needed, okay? Because things can get a little confusing down the road because we're going to use at least three or four conversion factors. Why do we need these conversion factors? because that's how we're going to solve the problems. For example, okay, we may have a question that says, let me clear this up a little bit. How many micrograms are in 0.125 grams? Okay. Well, the first thing we do is we write down what we're given. Okay, this is my, my stepwise procedure. Now, obviously, the answer I've given, I've given here to you, but I'm going to stepwise it. So I write down what I'm given, okay? And then I write down with respect to units what I'm looking for based on the question. The question says how many micrograms. So those are the units that I'm striving for because I'm, I'm following the units, okay? As I follow the units, it's gonna direct me to put in factors in here so things cancel out accordingly, all right? So that's my roadmap, kilograms to micrograms. So obviously I need a factor here that one, I need to get rid of kilograms. So I'm gonna multiply by some factor with kilograms in the denominator. Okay, and I know from my table up above that there are a thousand grams in one kilogram. So that's my first factor. And then I, as I put my factor in, I check my units. If I were to multiply it right there, unit wise, I end up with grams. Okay, but that's not what I'm looking for. 
I'm looking for a microgram. So obviously I need one more factor that would get rid of my grams, okay? And relates to micrograms, right? So I know that there are a million micrograms in one gram. Again, based on that table that we showed you up there. And you make reference to that table up there, whatever it takes to help you to become more comfortable with this. And uh, as I set that up, I'm following my units and making sure that I'm canceling my units, okay? So the first factor I put in there, I put the unit I'm trying to get rid of in the denominator, right? And then give me a new, new unit on the numerator. I may need to have a second factor to get rid of that unit. So that's what my second factor does, gets rid of my kilograms and gets me to the units I'm striving for in micrograms. Now, when we start doing this, right, with, with chemical reactions, we'll be using products, you know, this amount of product, A plus B gives me C, we're going to be setting up factors and we're going to be able to set reactions up with at least three factors. Okay, and by keeping track of my units, canceling things out, I got the problem set up properly. Now, I guarantee you 99%, if you set it up with the proper units and you follow the units, you're gonna be 99% correct. Why? Because you followed the units. Why not 100%? Because I don't control the calculator. <laughs> okay, you control that and in, in put in the correct number. And so once you set that up, the units are set up properly. Now it's just a function of you punching in the numbers in the calculator, checking your sig figs, and you're good to go. Notice obviously here, we start off with three sig figs. These conversion factors are exact numbers, so they play no role in sig figs. 1,000 grams, there's exactly 1,000 grams to one kilogram. It's an exact number. So it plays no role in sig figs. So the 0.125 has three sig figs. Our answer would be 125 million micrograms, okay? And that is by setting up the problem keeping track of your units, okay? Writing down what you're given in the problem, writing down the units that you're looking for, and then putting in factors in between ratios such that the units cancel out, and then just do the mathematics, keep track of your six figs, and you're good to go, okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, there are uh, three conversion factors that we give you, okay? They're in the shapes table. That is one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Okay, that gets us from the English to the metric. One pound is uh, equal to 454 grams. And one quart is equal to 946 milliliters. Now, I got to follow the format that the rest of the department uses. So I'll go with this. Is, is this the following two units, uh, the one pound to grams, the 454 grams to one pound, one quart to 946 milliliters are not exact numbers, okay? Okay, they're measurements and therefore could be a factor in uh, the sig figs of your final answer. Okay. The top factor is treated as exact. Two, five, four centimeters in one inch. And so only that unit is not considered an measurement and is considered an exact number and therefore will not pay a factor uh, with respect to sick pigs. But the bottom two could be a factor. Obviously the one pound is an exact number, but the 454 is a measurement. So there's three sig figs there. The one quart is an exact number, but the 946 is three sig figs is a measurement, okay? So when you use, and you'll find, you'll find a, a variety of sig figs with numbers, uh, let me restate that. You'll find a, a number of conversion factors uh, for these that give you more decimal places. My suggestion is just use these because the answers are 
the answers of uh, on canvas are based on these conversion factors. Okay, and if you use a different number, a different like you know four four fifty four point six, for example, your answer would be a little bit different than what the canvas has, and canvas is very exact with respect to the answer. Okay, so stick with these sig figs. The same is true with atomic weights. When we get to atomic weights of elements, use the atomic weights that we have on our, uh, our, our periodic table, okay? All right, so all these factors as any ratio can be written one or two ways. One inch, inch in the numerator or inch in the denominator. Pound in the numerator, pound in the denominator. Same with the court, okay? And this is true for any ratio. I use the examples of you know, $50 per hour, okay? Or, or I can write it as 50 over one hour or one hour over 50, or your mileage, your speed, 100 miles per hour. You know, for example, let's say, let's say, um, uh, you want to make a thousand dollars working at uh, you know fifty dollars per hour. You know, question is how many hours do you need to work? All right? And so what do we do? We write down what we're given, which is a thousand dollars. Okay. We look at our rate. And we're looking for units of hours. So hours are going to be in the numerator. And you know, dollars would be down in the denominator, $50. All right. And so I set that problem as follows. So I got a thousand divided by 50, which it gives me the units of hours, which is what I need to know. Okay. That's what I mean by follow the units. All right. So and I'm going to have an extreme example to demonstrate for you. All right, quick, quick uh, algebra, simple algebra review with respect to units. Okay, we have a squared divided by a. Another way to write a squared is a times a. That's that's what that is. A squared is a times a. Just like we did with the ten to the one power we did earlier with the scientific notation. And so a squared divided by a gives me unit wise, we get rid of one. So our, our units are a. So you know, keep in mind this is only true for a. So if I had a b there, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the case. Okay. That wouldn't be the case. All right. So let me uh, go and do an extreme. I can find it here. Give me a second. It disappeared on me. Okay. Now, this example, what I'm going to show you, is a very extreme example of converting units okay and i i picked this example because it's it's an extreme example it's it's a crazy example but it demonstrates how i i if by keeping track of units if you have conversion factors you can go from one unit to another with no problem okay and i use this example way back when i was teaching at uh, Carrington college for dental hygiene students so I, I arbitrarily make some conversion factors. I said, given the following conversion factors, how many DH students equal to four and a half bananas? Pretty crazy, huh? Right? Well, we can figure it out if, if we're given conversion factors. And we have some conversion factors. We say that one DH student is equal to six grapes. Okay? And we are given that three and a half grapes are equal to one orange. And one orange, if you use the polarity there, it's incorrect. One orange is equal to six toothbrushes, 
and two and six and three two brushes is equal to one banana. Pretty crazy, right? Well, that's how you're going to feel when we get to a chemical reaction. You're going to be like, well, wait a minute, we're going from here to here. That's okay. We got, we're going to walk through the conversion factor to get you from apples to bananas. Okay. All right. So let's set it up. So here's the conversion factors. Here's the question. Okay. We write down what we're given first. We're given that there are four and a half bananas. We want to know, and obviously, if I were to uh, write this out properly, it would be way down here someplace. I would need to know how many DH students. And I do that because I, that keeps track of my units. That's, that gives me a roadmap of where I got to go, okay? And what I need to get rid of and what, what new units I've been given and then what I need to get rid of those units and continue and continue, okay? And so I'm given that four and, a half, four and a half bananas. Well, I do have a conversion factor that gets rid of bananas. There's three toothbrushes per one banana. Right, so I set that up. I put it in there. I keep track of my units, and guess what? I got rid of bananas. So in order to stop the calculation at this point, then I can convert to two brushes unit wise. Okay. All right. Well, obviously that's not where I got to be. I got to go continue. So I can get some get rid of two brushes. So I got one more factor. I got a conversion factor that says that there's one orange is equal to six toothbrushes. I put two brushes in the denominator. Why is that? Because I already see the bananas are gone. And if I put in another factor here, my toothbrush units are gone, leaving me with units of orange, which is not where I need to be unit-wise. So I need one more factor to get rid of orange and get me into another unit, okay? And the following factor is there, conversion factor, where there's three and a half grapes per orange. Again, keeping track of my units, two brushes are gone, oranges are gone. Unit-wise, I'm at grapes. See how crazy it is? But now, if I were to stop the, the calculation, I would have gone from bananas, if I stop it here, from bananas to grapes. But I'm not going to stop it. Why? Because that's not what the question asked for. They want me, they want the, they want units of DH. Notice I've done nothing for the mathematics yet. All I've done is set up my conversion factors and keep track of my units. Okay. And so now I need one more. And I am finally in the units that I'm looking for. My first unit got rid of bananas. Okay, my second factor got rid of two brushes. Third factor got rid of oranges. And the fourth factor got rid of grapes and leaving me unit-wise with DH students, which is what I'm looking for. So now I've set up the problem properly, okay, with the uh, conversion factors where they should be. Now it's a matter of plugging in the numbers in the calculator, okay, and doing the math and I end up with 1.3 DH students, okay? So, long story short, it says that if I have, oh, I'm going out with my, my mouse here. If I have three and a half bananas, that is equal to 1.3 DH students, okay? Crazy, right? But the point of all this exercise is to demonstrate how given conversion factors in these ratios. See, all these factors here are nothing more than ratios. I can put them whatever way I need them, depending on what I'm trying to get rid of and what I'm trying to get unit-wise, okay? All right. So let us get into this. All right. Factors. Some of this we already talked about, but we, we'll go over it a little bit. Okay, we, we talk about the basic unit and the symbols for length, mass, volume, time. We didn't talk about time, but it's pretty uh, time unit. The basic unit is a second. Okay, so we got the lowercase m for meters, lowercase g for grams, uppercase l for liters, and lowercase s for uh, second. Okay. 
Uh, I have that table I gave you where the kilo prefix for the K symbol is a thousand times larger. And the deci prefix is 10 times smaller. So in one gram, there are 10 decigrams, okay? The centi prefix, which is the letter C, is a hundred times smaller, a hundred years in the century, that may help you out. And milli is given by the letter lowercase m, which is a thousand times smaller for milli, okay, and micro. And so those are the prefixes used in the metric system, okay? And there are some examples here that we are again going over the, uh, the PDF file with respect to the factors. We have one meter as you go through 100 centimeters, so on and so forth. Okay. okay. Now, yeah, obviously, as far as memorizing, it's up to you, but you got the table there, you got the prefixes. You know, keep in mind these ratios can be utilized. Now, I will talk about how you can combine these ratios. You know, a lot of these factors that we put, I put in parentheses, you know, to three factors, you know, a lot of those can be combined and simplified. I'll, I'll show you, if you already don't know right now, that's fine. If you know about it, that's fine. How you can do that, but I will talk about it here in a second. Let's keep it on the straight and narrow right now. So, um, this technique of keeping track of your units, it, your book talks, that gives it a name called factor label method. Uh, there's an, other names for dimensional analysis. You know, all these names for, you know, I keep, keep it simple. I just call it keep track of your units. In fact, that's what you're doing, right? And, you know, you identify the units, that what, what you're looking for, what you're trying to find. Look at what the units, so I write down the units I'm looking for, okay? identify the units in the material that I'm given. So you're gonna read the question, what am I given number wise? And then what am I looking for? That's that's my my trail to get to the units I need to get to. All right, all right. All right, so, and then we multiply factors in between as needed. All right, so, Check the units, and then obviously, like we've been doing with respect to, to uh, sig figs, keep, present your data with the proper sig figs. Uh, a lot of these factors are exact numbers, so they would not be, would not play a role in determining your sig figs. There's limited factors that are measurements, and therefore could play a role in determining the number of sig figs. Okay. Um, Sometimes you've been asked to show your work and basically when you're asked to show your work is basically just show your factors and how you came up with, with the answer. And showing your work, you know, I'm, I'm from the school of, okay, you got a question worth five points, you got to convert from apples to oranges, okay, that's fine. If you, I break that answer up in, in, in I maybe give you a point for the answer, the correct answer. But then the rest of the four points is given in how you set the problem up and how you demonstrate it. So if you just present the answer, you earn the point, okay? If you present how you showed your work and for whatever reason you typed in the wrong number and you got a wrong number because mathematics, I'm not gonna, and you set it up properly, of course, you're gonna get four points for I said, no, no, you won't get the point for getting the correct answer because it's a mathematical problem, right? So you do get credit, you know, it's not all or nothing kind of thing. And again, by the same token, if you don't show work and you present an answer that's incorrect, well, I have no way to give you credit to show to show that you did the work or demonstrate you did it correctly. So I have to give zero points, all right? All right, so keep that in mind when you um, uh, do the work and you have to present your data. All right, so an example here is how many liters are in 2,389 milliliters? Okay, point number one, keep track of your state figs. You are given 2,389 milliliters. How many sig figs are we looking at here? All right, we got four sig figs. So your answer should have four sig figs unless your conversion factor is one that is, that may be a role may play a role in your conversion in your uh, sig fix. 
All right, so what do we do? Well, you know, systematic approach. You know, once you, you're comfortable, you can, you know, bypass a lot of this stuff here, unless you get a shoulder work. So I write down what I'm given, which is 2,389 milliliters, okay? And then I write down the units of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for units of liters, all right? So that means I have a conversion factor here someplace where I got milliliters, and guess what? That unit has to be in the denominator, okay? Why? Because when I multiply by that factor, you know, th this whole number here, it's the same thing as saying two, 2,389 divided by one, right? So I got to multiply, so milliliters cancel. And I, I Fortunately, I know a conversion factor that gives me liters because I know that there's a thousand milliliters in one liter, right? So I can write that, put that right in there, one liter. And so now I've got my problem set up. Let's go back and verify my units cancel, okay? Leaving me with units of liters, which is what we're looking for. So I got the problem set up properly, okay? This conversion factor is exact. It's an exact number. Yeah. So it would not play a factor in my sig figs. So I got four sig figs over here. My answer should have four sig figs. So I take 2,389 divided by 1,000. And I should have an answer there. Okay. Of 2.389 liters. Okay. Again, look at my units there, how they cancel that. All right, so how many kilometers are in 12,300 centimeters? Well, I write down what I'm given, okay? I didn't write, write down what I'm looking for, but I'm looking for kilometers. Clicks, how many clicks? So I, have, I need factors that will get rid of centimeters, okay, which put me into meters. And then uh, get rid of meters to put into kilometers. So I got two factors here where my centimeters cancel, my meters cancel, leaving me with units of kilometers. Okay. Now, if you if you pick up on this, notice something here. That conversion factor, I can combine that. Okay. <coughs> Think about that, one kilometer is 10 to the fifth centimeters. You know, if I, if I just multiply these factors here, yeah, if I just multiply these factors here, do, can I not have, that would be 10 to the third, 10 to, 10 to the fifth centimeters. Right, because my meters cancel, right? These combine, this combines to give me that. Okay. I can do that. But if you don't see it, leave it alone. Keep them separate until you're more comfortable with it. And so I have 0 0.123 kilometers. Both factors here are exact numbers and therefore do not play a role with respect to sig figs. Uh, you're given 12,300, which has three sig figs. Our answer should have three sig figs. Okay. Now, with respect to English units, here are some factors you may want to be familiar with. All right. Uh, one cup is one, uh, two cups is one pint, two pints is one quart, four quarts is a gallon. Obviously, there's 12 inches to a foot, there's two feet to a yard, 1,760 yards to a mile. Another one's not in here, 5,280 feet to the mile. That's another way. Uh, 60 seconds in a minute, pretty standard stuff, right? 60 minutes in an hour. Uh, or any combination there, if you can combine, that's fine too. You know, 336 minutes in an hour, something like that. Or 3,600, I should say. And two hour, 24 hours in a day. Okay. So, with those kind of factors, we can utilize now, give, and plus those three other factors that we gave you, you have in your shapes table, we can start working problems where we're going from metric to English or English to metric, okay? Right? Um, 
you got this factor, this here to help you out. Because I always had trouble with gallons and quarts and pints, and this kind of helped me out. Where we got the big G, where it represents one gallon. So we got one gallon is equal to has four quarts or four Qs within that gallon. So we got four quarts. Okay. Now, if you look within the quart, we got one quart. Within the quart, there are two Ps, that's two pints. Okay. And if you look inside one of the Ps, there's two Cs that says that one pint is equal to two cups. So with that in mind, now you got three conversion factors here. Again, you can co combine them, you know, together if you make one, you know, and hope you can recognize, give you some food for thought. There's 16 cups in one gallon using these conversion factors, right? Once you work through that, see if you can figure that out. All right, so for example, we have how many gallons are in 44.5 cups? Well, again, we write down what we're given, okay? And what we're looking for is gallons. And so we need conversion factors that one gets rid of cups. Well, what do we know? We know that there are two cups and one pint. Right? That, got, that gets rid of it, rid of the cups. Right? But we're not at gallons, so we need a conversion factor that gets rid of pints. We know that there are in one quart, there are two pints. And it looks like we're going to need one more. Oh, whoa, 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 what do I do here? <laughs> no, see, it's a good mistake to, to make your, you know, notice that I put a quart in the denominator. And then when I looked over here, I said, whoa, why well, it doesn't cancel with pints, right? So that's not, not right. So that's a good, this is the advantage of keeping track of your units. You can tell right away if you set this up properly. And so actually we need, quarts in the numerator and pints in the denominator. See that? All right, so what do we know about pints in quart? We know there are two pints in one quart, all right? And then finally, it's a little messy here. Uh, we got uh, gallons in the numerator because that's what we need unit-wise and quarts. So we got one gallon, four quarts, okay? Let me get rid of my messiness and bring in the the one is not so messy. So here's the first conversion factor. We get rid of cups, and then the second one gets rid of pints, and then finally the last one gets rid of gallons. And you can see the units cancel out, and leaving us with 2.78 gallons. Okay. Obviously, those conversion factors are exact numbers and do not play a role in sig fig. So you're starting. What you are given determines the number of sig figs at the end. Hopefully, you can see here that you can make one factor because two, uh, two times two is four times four is sixteen. So you, another way to write that conversion factor is to say that there are sixteen cups in one gallon. And that's a legitimate conversion factor. You go directly to gallons from cups. You know? or any other ones in between, you know? Right. Um, here we have how many inches in three and a half yards. So we write down what, we, what we're given, three and a half yards. And we're looking for inches. I don't have that written down, but the first factor gets rid of yards and puts me into feet, okay? Now I gotta get rid of feet and I know that in 12, there's 12 inches in one foot. Check my units, feet cancel, yards cancel, leaving me with units of inches. And do the math, I end up with 126 inches. Now, here's a question posed for you. Can I present my data as 126 inches? Okay, and that, and that is correct, Trevor and Amy, no. 
Why? Because my factors are exact, but my three and a half is not. 126 has three. So I have to give my answer with three sig fig, two sig figs, excuse me, did I say, I said that wrong. Three and a half, he has two sig figs, 126 has three sig figs. So my answer should have no more than two sig figs, right? And so that's my two sig fig position right there. Okay, this is where your rounding comes into play like we've been doing with the other examples. I look at the neighbor, neighbor's a six, it's greater than eight or, or equal to five, therefore the two gets bumped up to three, okay? And so our answer is 130 inches, okay? And that puts it, uh, yes, 126 is a lot more accurate, obviously, but I only have two significant digits in the beginning with my answer, three and a half, three and a half yards. So I cannot have more accuracy than the three and a half. Okay. All right, these I mentioned already to you that uh, one inch is equal to 2.54 is considered an exact number and therefore would not play a factor in uh, determining sig figs, okay? But the other two conversion factors of pounds of 454 grams is an approximate, so measurement, and 140 equal to 946 milliliters is also a measurement. So they could play a factor, okay? And yes, this is given to you in the shapes table. It's one of the two tables that you need to download and utilize when you're given exams or use for your homework or whatever you need it for. All right, how many pounds are in 248 grams? Okay, well, we know that there are, uh, one pound is equal to 454 grams. So we set up the factor so that grams cancel out, okay? leaving us with pounds because that is what we are looking for, unit-wise. So you can see here in my grams cancel, leaving me with units of pounds, okay? I got three sig figs and 248, and 454 is a measurement, but I got three sig figs. So in that case, both of them have the same number of sig figs. I should, my answer should have three sig figs. Uh, how many inches are in 354 times 10 to the negative three kilometers? All right, so we got a lot more conversion factors here. Okay, I got my first conversion factor that gets rid of kilometers. Okay, because I know back from my tables, I know that there are a thousand meters in one kilometer. So I can use that, okay? And that gets rid of kilometers. And then I, I do need to go to inches. So I'm not even nowhere near that. So I gotta, I gotta eventually get to one inch is equal to 254 centimeters. That will get me into units that I can convert to inches. So I'm in meters right now. So I need one more factor that will get me into centimeters. And there it is right there. That's where the second factor comes into play. And then finally, my final factor to get me into inches, okay? And unit-wise, I'm there, okay? <clears throat> All these three factors are exact numbers and therefore would not play a role in my sig figs. Uh, so I got my answer should have three sig figs, 3.54. So here comes your, you can type it in in scientific notation or remove the decimal point over three times to the left, type it in longhand, but you know, it's a good opportunity here to practice on scientific notation. Type that in, do your math, and you're good to go, okay? So here's an example of going from metric units to English units. And you'll find examples of going the other direction. Okay. And for example, you might look at this, you know, it's really, you got two separate units. You, we will do problems that we will go from units of what we call moles, and we're going to convert that to liters, okay? 
and and the chemical reactions calculations that we're going to do. So you see how foreign they are. You got moles, which of course you're not familiar with right now, or you may be, but that's one set of one set of moles. Or or even furthermore, we can be in units of grams, convert that to moles, and then go to liters. Okay. Uh, moles is a U.S. conversion, right? Uh, moles? No, no, no. We're we're. I, I I use that as an example, but moles is a number that we're going to talk about. It's a big, 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 big number. It's a um, yeah. So I just threw that in there to kind of demonstrate how foreign the units that we're going to be using and doing are going to get. We're going to go from grams to moles to liters. It yeah, does. I thought Mo I thought moles is U.S. conversion or U.S. metric. No. Yeah. yeah. System. Yeah, moles is accounting is a number used in, in physics and, and chemistry. It's like uh, the word uh, dozen. I, I'll, I'll introduce it now. Uh, everybody understands or is familiar with the term dozen, right? And that is 12, right? 12 units of something. Well, I tell you, here we got a new number. Do we call this the chemist dozen? We call that the mole. Not mole, but the mole. This number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd units of whatever you want to count. You want to count one mole of donuts, that's a lot of donuts, right? It's just a number, but we'll be using it in chemical calculations. And we're going to be using it with these ratios. And that's what the whole idea here of, of setting up these units properly, the proper ratio that units can solve, because we're going to go from grams to moles to liters, okay? And it's universal. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is universal. Correct. All right, here we got a two liter bottle. We want to figure out how many quarts we have. So here we have 2.0 liters. We're going to convert the liters to milliliters. That's, that's that first factor. And then we have the English to metric unit where we have that one quart is equal to 946 milliliters. So we set that up as follows, keeping track of our units. Okay, milliliters cancel, leaving us with quarts, which is what we're looking for. And then it's a matter of, of uh, uh, typing in, uh, plugging in numbers and doing the calculations. All right. So notice here, 946 is a measurement. So it could be, be a factor in your sig figs. However, you're given 2.0, which has two sig figs. If, if, for example, the if they were you were given 2.000 liters. And then what will control your sig figs will be the 946. You see how that works? Because the 946 is a measurement and could be a factor in sig figs. All right. Like so, <laughs> you know, try, try to do the homework uh, on your own, obviously. There's a lot of examples of uh, uh, conversion factors, uh, your, your, uh, your uh, worksheets has a lot of examples. And if you're having problems with them, bring them to class. We can more than happy to go over them and work them through, OK? All right. So what I'm going to do here, since I got 326, we will, we, we're about halfway done. We will finish this up on Thursday and get you ready for next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is the first uh, exam, which again, to remind you, will be open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. So during that time span, uh, the exam is uh, timed at 75 minutes, I believe. Uh, I want to say there's 24, 25 questions. Okay, so give yourself, plan ahead, give yourself plenty of quiet time so you can sit down and be able to do that exam, exam okay? Um, let's, let's stop it here. We're done with chapter two, we got three, and then on slide 13.
Yeah, let's stop in here. Any questions?